Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on this lovely Wednesday evening. Uh, today, it is Wednesday, February 24th, and we will be discussing Making and Maintaining Space by Sam Claude Carmel. Uh, we're going to have a couple minutes just to let some more folks in, uh, so please stay tuned. Again, welcome to the people that are just now joining us. Uh, we will start at exactly 5.05 .05 p.m. Hello and welcome, hello and welcome. Um, also, please make sure to tune in on Wednesday, March 3rd at 5 p.m. for State of Touching with Bells Howard. Again, it is at 5 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday. Again, hello and welcome for those who just joined for joining us on Wednesday, February 24th, uh, 5 p.m. for Making and Maintaining Space with Sam Claude Carmel. Uh, we will again start very shortly in about a couple minutes. Uh, we just wanna allow some more people to come in. Um, I hope you guys are all enjoying the beautiful sun outside because it's a very, very nice day in the mission today. Again, if you want any more information about our program here on the screen, uh, you can register for the next upcoming programs at 500capstreet.org slash programs. Um, the next one will be next Wednesday and it will be featuring me, uh, Bells Howard. Um, and again, that will be at 5 p.m. PST. Also, uh, we are just now noticing that we kind of have an interesting little Zoom glitch where it might be changing your name. Feel free to change it uh, in your settings options of your Zoom. And also would like to apologize uh, for that technical difficulty. We will get started in just a couple moments, folks. Wow, we got an awful lot of people who have my same first name. Attack of the Saint. Again, we'll just start in one minute. I would like to thank you all once again for joining us for Making and Maintaining Space with Sam Claude Carmel. Um, I hope you all are having a lovely Wednesday evening and this program will be from 5 p.m. PST to 6 p.m. PST. Uh, and as it says on the screen below, if you would like to register for any of our future three programs that are happening with our other artist guides, 500capstreet.org slash programs. There's also a link in the bio if you are so interested.
again, welcome all. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm Justin Nagel, and I'd like to welcome you to our second Artist Guide led online programmatic series in our opening the cabinet. Um, thank you all for attending and showing your interest and enthusiasm for this event and past and upcoming. Uh, with the opening the cabinet program, we hope to expand and explore the dialogue between the house and the Bay Area conceptual art movement in a series of cross disciplinary performative lectures, talks and readings centered around the house's new online publication called the cabinet. Organized and presented by the David Ireland House's Artist Guides each Wednesday evening from February 17th to March 10th at from 5 to 6 p.m. We offer these free uh, lecture series that draw on and are inspired by David Ireland's conceptual threads of isolation, protection, and wonder. Uh, make sure to join us next Wednesday, March 5th at 5 p.m. for our next uh, program in the series, State of Touching with Bells Howard. Before we get started, I would like to draw your attention to our recently announced residency with Bay Area artist David Wilson. Over the next four months, Wilson will be exploring the archives and situating the David Ireland House in the context of the Mission neighborhood through a series of sport walks and drawing exercises. His residency will conclude with an exhibition, public ephemeral installations, and a series of public programs in the spring of 2020. One, stay tuned to this and other programs by following us along at 500capstreet.org, signing up for our newsletter, and following us on social media at 500 Cap Street. I would also like to say thank you to the team at the David Ireland House, Leanne Ladia, our exhibitions and programs manager, Kate Malloy, our director, and our artist guides, Bells Howard, Camille Messerly, Justin Arnagel, Laura Pacini, Sam Carmel, Stephen Liskatoff, Will Moncoya, and our lead artist guide, Alex Amer. Thank you also to the board members, advisors, supporters, and viewers like you for adding to this evening's success. Special thank you to Janet Delaney and Tom Marioni for their time and use of their images in the development of Sam's program. Tonight's program, Making and Maintaining Space, highlights David Ireland's concept of maintenance action and draws parallels to the labor of San Francisco's past conceptual art spaces, New Langton Arts, Museum of Conceptual Art, and the Museum of Conceptual Art that served as the blueprints to the next generation of community art spaces in the city. Carmel will also examine the community building that made these past organizations successful and expand on new strategies for the longevity and adaptability of San Francisco's emerging art spaces. In this program, Carmel will begin with a lecture analyzing deconstructing and reconstructing the history of SOMA, the SOMA Arts District. Afterwards, there will be a facilitated discussion finishing up with a public Q&A. Please drop your questions in the chat box below. Um, it is with great pleasure that I, I get to introduce you all to my wonderful colleague, Sam Claude Carmel. Sam Claude Carmel. They Them is a video installation and sculpture based artist who also works as an assistant video archivist and writer at Texas Tomboy brand Prod. They are currently creating a SOMA based gallery known as Liminal Space SF, which will be the focal point of the latter half of this discussion. Please welcome me, uh, join me in introducing Sam. Woo! Hi. Um... It's so nice to be here with you all tonight. And um, I just wanted to begin my program with a quote um, from Dan Ick um, that he shared with us before uh, I, I get started. There was no doubt a plethora of spaces being run by artists during the 70s and 80s period. Some are still around, ATA, Artist Television Access, and Southern Exposure, to name a few. On any night, you can see performances at ARE, Lama Mel, Sight, 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 Jet Wave, The A-Hole, Bluxem Street Gallery, not to mention the 80 Langton, New Langton Arts in Mocha. Like Jock would say, if there's a need, fill it. And with that, I'll begin um, into the history of the Soma District. Many of the warehouses remaining in the South and Market neighborhood have weathered the passage of time standing in some locations for over a hundred years. These buildings have housed factories and enabled the rise of multiple industries in San Francisco. 
Transitioning in the early 20th century into a center of fabrication and trade, the once sparsely populated upper-class neighborhood of the mid-19th century became an industrial powerhouse containing sweatshops, factories, and flop houses for workers of multiple varieties of trade and recent immigrants. Located centrally to the docks of San Francisco and aided by the invention of cable cars, Soma, or South of the Slot, as it was then called, became a hub of economic growth, active also in the evenings by the bustle of laborers, sailors, and night workers. As the industry came and went from South of Market, artists came to take advantage of the large warehouses that made possible affordable studio and gallery space. Starting in the 60s through the mid 70s and beyond, San Francisco held a burgeoning community of younger artists working in new mediums of performance, installation, and video. Exploring mediums then to avant-garde for existing commercial galleries and museums, artists, their supporters, and patrons began organizing various opportunities for each other in DIY and experimental spaces. The area's fertile past of artists founded and led institutions such as MOCA and New Langton Arts nurtured the roots of today's downtown modern arts museum district. MOCA and New Langton Arts share many similarities to David Ireland's locales. Their dates of creation, experimental and unconventional approaches to showing art, bordering neighborhoods of South of Market and the Mission in San Francisco, and the relationships and interconnected community shared by those who inhabited those spaces. In an act that serves as a gorgeous metaphor recalling the circle of, of life, Jock Reynolds, a founding figure of the San Francisco conceptual art movement, purchased and renovated a former coffin factory at 80 Langton Street and made the ground floor available for a new organization to support emerging artists. Sandblasting the first floor and, and adding amenities to the building, Reynolds' actions of creating his space mirrored those of many artists building their own mixed-use living spaces and studio situations in Selma. Inspired by gallery and museum models that were committed to artist control, financial support, and support of artists by artists, nonprofit 80 Langton Street Corporation was created in 1975 and opened its doors that July. 80 Langton Street served as the incubator and home of New Langton Arts, a critically important space for the emerging conceptual arts community of San Francisco. Reynolds later moved next door to 1246 Folsom Street to allow New Langton Arts more room to flourish. 80 Langton Street was dissolved in 2010 after financial challenges made the organization inoperable, closing after almost 35 years as a pillar of San Francisco's experimental art scene. The San Francisco Museum of Conceptual Art, or MOCA, was founded by Tom was founded by the artist Tom Marioni, who was a San Francisco-based conceptual artist active in the emergence of conceptual art from the 1960s to 80s. MOCA served as another major showing and gathering space for the conceptual art movement in the Bay during the 70s. Its former location at 86 Third Street and later 75 Third Street above Brains Bar is now the center of San Francisco's art museum district. I believe that actually, um, where MOCA is now is becoming the, the new uh, Mexican Museum. MOCA had an attitude of acceptance and experimentality from its inception in 1975 as America's first experimental art space. Tom Marioni founded MOCA as a response to the lack of opportunity he, he perceived in San Francisco for, for artists going beyond the figurative and funk movements of the 60s. There was no place to show process-based and performance art, so Marioni decided to create the festival for this generation of artists. With an ethos that embraced the beginner, Marioni extended the invitation to show and collaborate within the space to many emerging artists and students, which expanded their opportunities to show beyond the Bay Area. MOCA was a museum focused around the idea of daily acts and practices of life as art, 
And David Ireland's practice had harmony with this intentional mode of working. David Ireland was a foundational Bay Area conceptual artist whose art seamlessly flowed from his layered life as a maker, mentor, and explorer. Born in Bellingham, Washington on August 20th, 1930, Ireland began his education in San Francisco at CCAC, California College of the Arts and Crafts, as it was then called, later returning to his hometown of Bellingham, Washington to raise a family. The lust for travel beyond small town life eventually led Ireland to his journey throughout continental Africa and Southeast Asia, where his vivifying experiences cultures, creatures, and natural elements the lands he encountered encouraged his eye for material and his physical modes of making. Returning to San Francisco in his mid-40s to continue his arts education with an MFA in printmaking from SFAI, Ireland cemented himself as a key figure in the emerging Bay Area conceptual art movement. Expanding the possibilities of artistic practice through his installations and friendships with contemporaries and students. David Ireland was working on his sculptural home, 500 Cap Street, when he was introduced to Tom Marioni. Marioni hired Ireland to restore Mocha's interior wall to its previous state after Daryl Sapien's exhibition left a rectangle of white over the brick wall, hiding the marks of prior activity in space. Through photographs provided by Marioni, Ireland painstakingly worked to recreate the lingering marks and colorations on the walls of Mocha to restore it to its former aesthetic. This work in Mocha functioned as a partial recreation that was a memory of a place and condition accessed through restoration and archive. A, phys a physical and material gesture towards the space's past generations of inhabitants. This backward renovation converses with theories of queer temporality. Ireland's tracing and recreation of the former marks invokes past bodies in an act of haptic remembrance. Ireland's magnum opus, 500 Cap Street, is a poignant example of art as the activity and labor of daily life. Building out his house starting on November 5th, 1975 in the mission as a sculpture and a platform for his art making practice, Ireland's maintenance actions to care for and full scale stabilization of his home mirror the labors of maintaining and building out the aging structures of Soma for repurposement as live workspaces. Lacquering the walls of his home in amber polyurethane to preserve the traces and scuffs of past inhabitants, Ireland considered the physical material and wear of his home to be vital to its function as a sculpture. David Ireland's 500 Cap Street and 65 Cap Street homes as sculptures are spaces located adjacent to and deeply interconnected with the Soma community. Both locations speak to the experimental possibilities and modes of working of the 60s and 70s conceptual arts movement. When 500 Cap Street was acquired in 2008 after Ireland moved out due to his declining health in 2004 and his passing in 2009, it underwent a seismic restoration. A new archive room and garage were built to reinforce the house as Ireland dug a grotto underneath the foundation of his home in a pursuit of raw material and meditative action. When the 500 Cap Street Foundation opened its doors in 2016, New Langton Arts facilitated its public open hours as an act of support and collaboration with the emerging organization. 65 Cap Street is a foundational space uh, born from Ireland's sculptural design located near his personal residence, 500 Cap Street. When the house was put on market and acquired by Anne Hatch, Ireland assisted Hatch in developing an artist residency outside of the traditional box at 65 Cap Street. Cap Street Project, a visual arts residency and venue dedicated to new work, experimental installations, art making processes was created by Hatch in 1983. 65 Cap Street is a foundational space in the Mission neighborhood for its contemporary arts and has given a platform to many international and local programs through its public exhibitions and artist residencies. Like, like 500 Cap Street, Ireland sculpturally transformed and designed the interior of 65 Cap Street. The physicality of the space has shifted over time as other directions were taken in an effort to ensure the evolution and involvement of artists in the residency program. 
though traces of Ireland's hand remain in the structure of the building. In recent years, both the mission and SOMA have undergone the throes of gentrification through the expansion of the second tech boom. The ability for smaller art spaces to hold on in these neighborhoods has been tested by rising rents and then the addition of highway infrastructure, which made the previously secluded district accessible and convenient to the rest of San Francisco. With the tech industry fleeing San Francisco due to the economic impact of COVID-19 for cheaper rents out of state, SOMA and the Mission are in the midst of another transformation. The warehouses and other buildings that remain affordable for working artists are still few and far in between, and those that do are oftentimes dilapidated, requiring structural work and in-depth construction. San Francisco has reached its next wave of experimental artists, and we have a community in desperate need of platforms for showing our work. I look to the past of the missions and physical localities of former artist-led institutions as I develop my own gallery in the Selma neighborhood, Liminal Space SF. Before I encountered the building at, 65, at 16 Sherman Street that would become host to Liminal Space SF, I didn't allow myself the dream of starting a gallery in San Francisco. The sudden shock of quarantine shook up for the time being my previous dream of becoming an expat. I had taken a year off completing, after completing my BFA at Mills College in 2019 and in the future planned to pursue further education and arts and to build a gallery overseas in Berlin. Over the months prior, I had been searching for an affordable studio space as I was longing to restart my cultural practice as the limitations of working at home were stifling my creativity and ramping up my cabin fever. After what felt like months of searching to no avail, a friend of mine mentioned that a room was opening up at her studio complex. Little did I know that several of my community of artists and friends had been tenants of the space before. The pale purple cobalt of the building at 16 Sherman was the first detail I noticed. A lovely color in a neighborhood swiftly being overwhelmed by a sea of beige and gray. Located near the crux of 7th and Folsom, this was a neighborhood I knew intimately from late nights out at the stud at 9th and Folsom, catching the best of San Francisco's experimental techno and queer performing arts. The Eagle's current state of, of uncertainty after its building has been put on market and the stud's recent closure due to the inoperable rise of rent have hit me personally and widened an aching void in my heart. With the knowledge that the culture of my favorite SF neighborhood is in crisis, I'm compelled to fight back by staking a claim in the neighborhood for the queer and trans communities, arts and culture, including with the love our straight and cisgender friends who support us. The interior of the warehouse at 16 Sherman is in disrepair. A former sweatshop, the building has seen much abuse by the constant activity of bodies operating a clandestine fabric factory. The building's interior drywall was covered in an ugly spray on stucco that I immediately decided had seen its last days. To smooth out the walls, I mudded over by putty scraper, this bumpy texture with joint compound, flattening the walls back to a blank palette. After applying almost 50 pounds of material, I began the dusty process of sanding the walls to uniform flatness. Inside, the concrete walls of our studios are crumbling due to water damage through exposure to the elements over the last 100 years. A thick layer of paint covering the concrete wall in my studio was bubbling up due to a mistake in material choice by a previous tenant. And I began to remove it with a hammer in my air compressor needle tool, a process that has taken over two months, much to the dismay of my downstairs neighbor. In order not to be a bother, I have worked at odd hours, often staying from the late afternoon to the, through the early evening, hammering the walls in what felt like an endless series of violent strokes, lifting clouds of concrete into the air. This physical process, however tedious, helped me to get my upper body back in shape after months of inactivity due to quarantine. Pounding a concrete wall has turned out to be a surprisingly effective stress reliever, and it was a pleasure to go to bed with a sore upper body for the first time all year. Soon after I secured the first studio at Sherman Street, the seed of an idea was planted in my mind to create, if only for a fleeting moment in time, the next space for queer and trans art in Soma as an act of praxis and homage to the joys the previous had given me. Because I am privileged enough to inhabit a portable space in the neighborhood, I have a responsibility to share access and resources with my community. Working on liminal space has given me a goal, 
that keeps me out of bed and focused on the future. I'm no longer disassociating and staring at the wall, mourning the spaces where I came of age. And I'm in an active practice now of creating a community and opportunity for myself and others. It's necessary for the vitality of an art scene for artists to support each other. And I've been given helpful lessons and advice from past and current art spaces in order to make mine a reality. I look to Renny Pritikin's prescription for a healthy art scene as a guide as I grow in those days. And the prescription's here, I'll read it out to you. One, a large pool of artists. There's a critical mass or tipping point that makes a scene. We have that right now. Two, teaching opportunities which help support the pool of artists. Three, active art schools which feed into the pool of artists and give artists teaching opportunities. Four, studio space that's affordable as well as live work law that allows artists to occupy light industrial spaces. Five, alternative spaces that give exhibition and residency opportunities for new art and ideas. Six, adventurous art dealers who take on new artists, support artists with sales. Seven, adventurous collectors who buy locally and buy new work, make their collections available to students. Eight, sophisticated writers to document, discuss, and promote new ideas, continuing regional development. Nine, publications for them to write for. 10, newspaper critics who are thoughtful and sophisticated and talented. Fellowships and grants available for artists and writers. 12, accessible museums and curators who talk to each other and use studio visits with local artists. 13, interested audiences who attend all of the above and read about it. 14, access to specialized materials or businesses such as high-tech materials in the SFA area or film arts industry in LA. 15, social space where new ideas are being generated about art, about society, about the role of art. 16, hangouts, parties, salons, lecture series, restaurants, and bars where a sense of community is manifested. 17, articulate artist leaders. 18, heroes, iconoclasts, villains, people everyone loves to hate. 19, artists and residency opportunities. 20, progressive political climate that encourages art as opposed to, say, Julian using his office to go after the Brooklyn Museum. 21, opportunities for artists to get involved in politics. 22, opportunities for public art, city or private. 23, events that bring people together, scheduled multi-gallery opening nights, for example. And I would add another one, and there's more to add too, but I would add an art scene that's open and embraces uh, diversity, including gender, sexuality, race, class, religion, having the most diverse kind of artists that you can have around as, as, a, as a community is really critically important. Um, that's uh, my presentation for y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we're gonna go on to uh, me and Justin's Q&A right now. Thank you so much, Sam. That was fantastic. Um, before I like dig into some of my questions that I prepared previously, I wondered if you could maybe um, talk about this prescription a little bit more and kind of maybe unpack how you are trying to kind of fill the prescription, as it were. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, I think really one of the, the critical things that we need um, in San Francisco are social spaces for artists. And we've lost a lot of, of spaces, just pure spaces due to quarantine. Like, you know, these bars and places that we used to hang out are closed. We can't go to the museum right now. Um, but what I'm trying to do with little spaces make it into kind of functionally, in a way, a community center. Place where people can go, you know, chat, learn some more ideas about art, and um, we are actually having a little bit more. Like I'm, I'm kind of more about net art too. Um, I really like how the internet can connect people from all different, you know, areas of the world and bring them together, you know, in, in a virtual space. But we we're going to be curating some like memes and some web art too, and I. I feel like having people participate from other spaces is going to be really fun 
too. And unfortunately, like, I don't feel like th there are a lot of these things that are prescriptions that really aren't necessarily so available in the city right now. And I think in the lack of, of opportunity to say that I have to teach, it's so hard to teach out here. There's, there's, there's no way I can get a job with just a BFA right now. Um, we have to like figure out ways that we can hire each other to lecture per se. Like artists have to find ways to dredge up money through, through grants or through fundraising through each other so that we can support each other. And we can, and we are educators. We can educate each other. I really believe that. You don't need to be teaching at an institution to be a teacher. Thank you for that thoughtful reply. And I think what's great too is like this idea of education and working with one another and kind of how what we're doing here too kind of fits into that as well. And you talk a lot about community and I think that's the thing that's kind of really stuck out uh, in the response and the program as well. So I was wondering if you could maybe kind of like, and I know you got to talk with Tom Marioni quite a bit in preparation for this. So I was wondering if you could um, talk about that and kind of his understanding of like the highest form of art is drinking beer with his friends and how that kind of has influenced or shaped kind of this process and your trajectory. Well, I feel like Tom's way of interfacing with his friends and community is very similar to the way that I interface with my friends and community. It's like, I feel like the best ideas and the best discussions that I have are when people are relaxed and they're allowed to be in their element. And it's like, for me, when I would go to the opening, you know, and have a glass of wine and, and be eating hors d'oeuvres with my friends and just talking to people I've never met before, have people come up to me and just say, hey, like that was one of the best ways I ever built community. Um, just in, just by going to art school, I don't necessarily say that you build community. I, the, the biggest community I built was the community I built outside of school, where I would just be going to openings, um, meeting people, and uh, just bringing in people from all different aspects of what my life looks like. But it's. It's great to get into conversations about art with people who aren't artists. I love talking to scientists. I love talking to, to lawyers even. It's just all these different perspectives really help shape um, and give some different dimensionality to the way that I approach work. But just getting together and being able to share a libation with friends, you know, and have those conversations open up. Love that Tom did that. It, it really, it I think it echoes the chord with all of us who uh, are in, the scene, I, I suppose. Yeah, so I wonder then too, like, right, I've been thinking about how things have shifted, right, and community has shifted, right, and you mentioned, right, everything is digital and you're kind of doing digital outreach and kind of, you know, that kind of like investing in digital work, like meme work and, you know, all of that. Can you kind of talk about how your uh, kind of plan to like operate uh, within the like the new art scene and kind of like what you see has happened in the kind of landscape and how you're trying to address that. Yeah, so um, particularly honestly with memes, so this is something that I think is critically important to show and to talk about. So a meme is, you know, it's basically an image that um, it's made to be replicated, made to be changed. Um, and uh, the way that memes have impacted our political landscape, you know, stuff going on 4chan or reddit um that's literally influenced the way that people think and perceive politics it's so fascinating to me and i don't think that the museum as an institution has really been focusing and spotlighting this yet but memes are also a really powerful way to make community and um interact with other people i know a lot of transgender people who you know have developed community out of like you know making and sharing these images and they're a really great way to spread theory, like critical theory in a way that's super accessible, super easy to read. And um, it's honestly, it's a way that a lot of kids are getting educated now too. Um, and we all have pretty short attention spans. So I feel like that's a, it's a medium that can translate information very quickly. And I think just the availability and, and the readiness it, 
that it, the medium is like anyone can make a meme. A 15 year old kid in Arkansas can make a meme and have it go viral and spread it around all around the world. And it's that's just another form of media I think that's really fascinating to focus on. And it's not one that people people are finding out ways to get compensated for their work digitally. I mean, but it's not it's not common to just you know pay somebody for an image you see online yet. I hope that I can figure out a way to make it so that digital content creators can get, you know, the right kind of compensation for their work and get the exposure they need. And in a gallery setting too, because we can't be talking about fine art, art all day and not be talking about this other medium of art that is, we, we've all seen memes. We probably see them every day, most of us, so. Thank you. Um, following that thread and kind of what you mentioned earlier about the this gallery space being kind of a pioneer in the Bay, like other spaces like New Langton and Mocha and even 65 Cap, I was wondering if you could talk more about like the need for that, right? And specifically kind of like this queer space that you're thinking about and kind of like what the Bay Area landscape looks like in relation to like those kinds of spaces and spaces that are trying to, um, you know, fulfill this prescription for a healthy kind of art scene. I feel like the more experimental your scene is, like just the, the more overlap you have with everyone, the more, you know, diversity that usually it brings in. But um, out here, there's a fair amount of institutions that do feature and in, in show queer and trans work, but there's a fair amount of them that really don't. Um, and, you know, there's a certain point when I can say, you know, is this space tokenizing our work as queer and trans people, like as a feature to do once in a while? Um, or some places, you know, really do have the best like intentions in mind and, the way that they uh, pull through stuff is amazing. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys saw Orlando at Magavoy, but that was a great show, just featuring all kinds of just different gender diverse work. And that's what I want to see more of, but I, I don't see it enough. Like when I see it, I go back and I go back to the same place like 20 times, no kidding. Like, and I just want to make a space where that's always accessible. And it hasn't always been, even growing up in the Bay Area, it was hard to find the queer and especially the trans uh, niche in the scene. Like there's probably like four or five trans artists that I know of like that are showing regularly in the Bay Area, but that's not enough. That's a that's a, just a drop in the puddle of what's out here and, and who is out here. And there's lots of young people who are making work that aren't being shown yet. And I'm really about elevating people who don't necessarily have like the whole art school training too, because it's it literally, to me, it's just a piece of paper at the end of the day. Like, and we're all kind of limited by whatever opportunities we have out here. And there's not a lot of opportunity for somebody who doesn't have an MFA, and even with an MFA. Like, that's what Marioni was dealing with uh, when he created uh, Mocha, because there, there just weren't those opportunities. And I'm at the same point where I'm like, you know, I can take this little space. It's not that big, but I can make it happen and I can fill up a room and we can bring people together and, and just introduce each other, you know? And that's how you build community so you can have a container for other things to, to pop open. I can't wait to see like what this certain wave right now of queer artists is gonna do because I've seen some amazing stuff and I'm really into the art and technology uh, that is coming out. So I can't wait to see what's gonna come through my gallery. Amazing. Yeah, that sounds, I, I'm like all for that, right? Like more queer art in the Bay, please. Um, like someone mentioned in our chat box. Um, and you mentioned experimentation, right? With these spaces, right? Like your space and then, you know, uh, Mocha and New Langton. Could you talk a little bit more about experimentation and maybe some kind of like examples of those spaces that you draw on and kind of like how you look to experiment further, right, with space and community in this way and in, in the SOMA in particular? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I admire about um, Mocha the most is that they give people the space to fail. Like, 
it wasn't just like, you know, I, you would sometimes like write a proposal and, you know, have an idea, but there was such a, a, a level of trust there where you could have somebody come in and do their exhibition and it's on you. It's all on you to pull it off and do it right. And I want to give people the space to fail too, because not every artist's work and especially their first works are going to be masterpieces. It takes a lot of trial and experimentation and error in order to, you know, start making the work that really speaks to what you're trying to say. But I'm interested in seeing new modes of technology being integrated with uh, like the body in terms of performance. Um, and I just, I want people to be outlandish and wild and, um, explore what, what the fantasy of their perception of their body or their perception of the art is like, and it's okay if things fall flat sometimes, but I, I, I think giving people that opportunity is the most gracious thing you can do because not all of us are going to be polished enough at this point in time in our career to, you know, be able to show in MoMA had, had they been looking for our work. It's, it's about making the moves, doing the work, in order to get there and learn more about yourself in the process. And you learn the most about yourself when you fail. Yes, also like polish is overrated um, sometimes. And I really appreciate that kind of, like just allowing things sometimes to let, like be what they are. Um, now I had a, a question for you, kind of going back to when you talk about David and Tom's collaboration on the wall at MoCA, you talk about this idea of ha haptic remembrance, right? Where space and kind of like draws you through, right? Through the kind of energy or affect that's left from bodies that occupy it. Can you kind of uh, expand on the role that this idea of haptic remembrance and like this notion of like, bodies touching space uh, kind of like plays, uh, like has a role in your work and kind of how important it was for you to kind of like understand this concept in relation to the space that you're creating. If that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I think of the, the dirty sweaty stud as, as my place of like really, when I think about haptic, like, that dance floor, you know, like being around like other queer people and that kind of energy that you get from touch, from brushing up against somebody, from leaning against the wall. And I, when Ireland, you know, did his renovate, his uh, stabilization in the house, you know, he, he would focus on those marks of like where, where your hand was, where, what a mark he, he made by scraping some furniture across the floor. It, it's like, those moments of physical touch were really important for Ireland to highlight. And for me in building out my space, um, the physicality of building it out is a really important thing. And like when I'm putting in all this physical work, it's, it's rhythmic. Like it was rhythmic when I was hammering the walls. It was like dancing. I was sweaty. I was like, wow, you know, block away. I'd be essentially doing the same thing, but <laughs> not breaking that wall, you know? And when I'm doing these physical things, I'm remembering um, these physical actions of work. I'm remembering these other times that I've had out uh, in the neighborhood. And I'm building this space, you know, with the intention to, to keep the spirit here, to keep that really thriving pulse of queer experimentation in, in Soma. And touch is so important in that. And it touches something that is so rare and scarce right now because we're living in COVID, basically isolated from each other. So the touch that I've had is touching this wall. It's been con putting the concrete up on this wall and smoothing it out by hand. And you know, having my hand in the space, I think, is important. It's showing this this labor and this care, um, like Ireland's. Yeah, there's something nice too about that visual that you just brought up about like touching the wall and like not just touching the object itself, but touching all of the like past lives that lived in the space that I think is kind of interesting and really like fertile um, for further exploration uh, just on my own and for everyone really. Uh, <laughs> um, but I want to ask you if you could expand on the name of your space, liminal space, kind of how do you 
see this operating, right? Does it afford or limit kind of understanding? And then how uh, have you seen, like, do you see connections with this like name or the kind of concepts to like David Ireland and his modes of making as well? Yeah, so, I mean, liminal is actually my favorite word. Um, and liminal means like a transition point. It's like a boundary. It's like uh, the space between the doorway and outside. Like, that's a liminal space. Um, and I think that in that intention, the name, I intended for it to be a place where people can launch off and go off to different uh, spaces where they can you know, start to build their career and, um, or be in conversation, further conversation with the work that's out here already. And it's liminal also because I have a feeling that we're not gonna be able to be in the neighborhood forever. There's the, with the rising rents of San Francisco and the kind of uncertainty that we even have in our building with our landlord, you know, if they're gonna sell every two years or not, um, that's part of it. But, you know, spaces come and go in San Francisco, that's just kind of the way it is. But liminal is a transformative word. And I think transformative really is, a, that's a word that I would use to describe uh, parts of Ireland's practice as well as the way that he would, you know, go and completely change his houses. And he was more, I think, focused on the actual um, building that the physical container, like what, what the phys physicality of the space was, where I'm, more focused on what it actually contains. Um, though not to say that he wasn't, but my interest is more who is going to be inside this container that I create and how to make sure that it's always overflowing. Nice, yeah, that, I like that sentiment about like kind of the container, right? Whereas David was concerned with the vessel and you're interested about what's inside the vessel. I think that's a really fascinating kind of connection, right? Between you and Ireland and this like notion of like pause or like the moment, right? Like David captured the moment, right? And it was a pause, right? Whereas you're thinking about the moment, but how that moment kind of transitions to the next moment and kind of pushes you. And I think that's fascinating. And one last question before um, I op we open it up to the audience questions. Um, not to put any pressure or anything, uh, just inquiring minds want to know, uh, when can we experience this new um, space that you're building out in the Soma district? So um, right now, I'm just kind of playing it by ear. Um, I honestly don't think it's going to be opening up for probably the next three or four months. I'm waiting till it really is safe and have it all clear to have like a large scale opening because I do want, you know, that community building to, to happen. Like, you know, our openings are honestly one of the best spaces for, you know, dirty work and networking. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Just building community, meeting people, cruising people. I mean, I know people are lonely right now. I know they want to meet other people. We want to make friends. We want to like, you know, have that space. And I think that in order to, uh, to really be successful, I, I want it to be an in-person thing. But in the meantime, I'm uh, planning some digital curation. So we're probably going to curate um, some memes and some other kind of net art. Um, but that's all going to be on uh, on our Instagram, Liminal Space SF, and that's just at Liminal Space SF, uh, which is that the programming is uh, developing. But I'm really more into actually having phys the physicality of, of an opening, of people actually experiencing art in person, because the, the digital, it's very flat and um, it's kind of hard to, to carry the interest forward. But, just we gotta wait it out until it's safe because I do want to have a, a great party. Love throwing a good party, yeah. So. 
Amazing. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. I will be there with bells on. I'll wear flowers. It will be fantastic. So <clears throat> we have a question from Kate Malloy, uh, and she wants to know, how has working at the David Ireland House over the past year influenced slash informed your trajectory with the space? Well, it's definitely taught me a lot about material just from, from the first off. Uh, learning about David's material usage from his use of like dirt and uh, concrete and um, polyurethane were really some of the most interesting parts uh, to me and how he, you know, peeled back all the wallpaper and could just expose the bare plaster of his walls. And, you know, these things that I, I learned and picked up on um, by working at the house translated over to the work that I was doing at Liminal in order to try and turn this ugly, really run down uh, space into something that, you know, can pass as a fine art gallery. And I say pass because we're not capital F fine. It's, it's all about, you know, what's good, not necessarily like what's fine or what's polished, but Ireland's practice really his material usage was the most fascinating thing for me um, as I've been working on this space and just using materials that are like super hardy, like concrete. Um, I like the industrial stuff. I, I understand uh, David uh, went to school for industrial design too. So there's a lot of overlap, I feel like, in my uh, admiration for that and his as well. Yeah, and I think working with you too, like the idea of like the industrial and that kind of hardy material that you talk about is something that resonates. It really sticks, uh, especially the way David uses it, it really sticks to your ribs, you know? Um, so we have another question from H who asked, uh, Sam, did you compile a list of all the art spaces from the SOMA that you were able to research outside of? Uh <laughs> I, I have, um, if, if you're interested, I, I have, I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but I definitely found out a lot of different spaces um, from around. Um, but yeah, I, I just talked to a lot of different people and I learned about some of these smaller spaces that were around. And, um, but I couldn't, in, in the time frame that I had to do this presentation, I honestly couldn't find out enough information to really um, have anything stick here. But I want to focus on the larger spaces, but uh, I uh, definitely, I interviewed um, Janet Delaney and I interviewed Tom Marioni, who were really, really helpful in giving me some foundational information uh, about just what the, the scene felt like back in the day and um, just different spaces that were around. And Janet Delaney's awesome, by the way, like such a sweet person, really just, incredibly talented photographer and um her first book about soma like documenting around you know the 80s and it, it was super foundational to like my presentation today and she's coming out with this new book she just got the good and I too she's talking about she's on she's on something else she's on something else but uh she uh is doing this book called uh, soma now and uh it's looks incredible with documenting all the gentrification and just different changes that San Francisco has undergone because of uh, the tech industry. And it's just, it's gonna be super interesting to see. I'm totally buying a coffee when it comes out. Nice, nice. So you mentioned um, talking with Tom and uh, Janet and our next question is from Leon and she wants to know about, uh, she she said, you know, she says, you did tremendous research on the subject. Who did you who did you interview within this process and how did that inform, inform your presentation? So like, if you could talk about the insight or the kind of uh, new things that they offered, Janet and Tom offered for you in this process and how it's kind of shifted your view or like informed your view. Yeah, so um, Tom talked a lot about just, you know, like, his different in interactions and uh, overlaps with other people around the Bay. And it was, he just gave me a really big survey of like all the stuff that he had been doing. And it was, it was very interesting to hear about that too. Um, and Janet um, told me a lot about how it was for her, you know, to be in this scene um, in Soma around uh, that time. But she explained to me that, you know, which is, 
there, she had a different level of access to these certain spaces than other people, you know, and opportunities that other people got. Um, so it's just interesting to hear that. I don't know, like, I feel like there are this, these different pushes for diversity now that weren't necessarily as prevalent um, in the 70s and 80s for sure. Like, you know, the, the truth is there's a lot of focus on uh, white male conceptual artists and, um, that was like what a lot of the scene was that though there were women, there were definitely women involved. Um, but it's, it's just interesting to hear a different kind of, uh, more feminist perspective on, uh, this as well, but there, there is, there were different, uh, scenes happening at the same time too. Like I, I'm always curious about where were the queer people and during the seventies, I mean, queer people were at the stuff, they were dancing to disco. Um, there wasn't really the rise of like a necessarily um, queer art or gay art specifically in the city around that time. That kind of came from, a, you know, Maple Fort like, that came from New York first. Um, so it was interesting to get those perspectives. And yeah, it's, it's like, I feel like, you know, talking about the real representation of what these spaces look like matters. And, uh, you know, it's just it's interesting to see how things have, have ebbed and flowed here and what has changed and what has stayed the same. Also, that sounds like an interesting avenue too, I think, to pursue this notion of like taking this moment and like shifting it to a feminist perspective or like kind of the alternate, like, you know, what were those kind of satellites or those queer contemporaries that weren't necessarily like in the mainstream, which is something that's fascinating. And I think something that you're a part of too, right? Is this like, uh, yeah, not outsider. Cause like that's, I don't like that term, but like, you know, on the periphery maybe is a better way to phrase it. But thank you so much, I Sam. <laughs> um, and <laughs> that is all the time we have today. Um, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us here. And I wanted to just bring your attention to our programming schedule that's also available on our website, 500capstreet.org slash programs. Um, and to stay on the lookout for Janet Delaney's new uh, book, Soma Now. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, especially after kind of the end of our discussion here. Um, about her and that kind of interesting perspective that she talked about. I also wanted to remind you again that uh, we have two more programs coming up. The next one is Wednesday, March 3rd at 5 p.m. with Bells Howard called A State of Touching, where Howard offers us a performance lecture using experimental visual and auditory elements to explore Gaston Bachelard's Poetics of Space in relation to Ireland's work. Uh, sculptural objects, pieces, and drawings of the house will be juxtaposed with a reading from Howard's essay, State of Touching, Part 2. And then the program after that on Wednesday, March 10th at 5 p.m. with William Moncayo on space is on space and surroundings, uh, where Moncayo will talk about artists that utilize space and surroundings in diverse ways, including Ana Mendieta, Felipe Delsadas, Bruce Nauman, and David Ireland. Following this presentation, Moncayo will facilitate a brief dialogue on how space and surroundings pertain to artistic practice, inspiration, installation, and process. I see that Tom's here. Uh... So nice to see you, Tom. Thanks everyone so much. It was really great having you and um, glad to, to share this presentation with y'all. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Justin. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, it was great. Appreciated it. Talk Thank to you all soon. Thanks. Bye, Jane. Thank you so much. <laughs> My name is Sam Carmel, too. <laughs> A lot of technical difficulties. <laughs>
my one of your performance artworks? <laughs> I guess, yeah. I, I would say that this is an extended performance. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, for joining. <laughs> Thank you, Tom Marioni, for joining. Thank you for contributing as well. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel, thank you, Pete, Camille, Alex, Leon. Thank you all so much. Fantastic. Have a nice evening. <laughs>